<laughs> okay, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Um, a, new, a new face running meetings now. Um, I've, I'm the, my name is Mark Phillips. I'm the newly minted president of the society. Um, and this is what we've got coming up tonight. So um, I'll go through a few slides before we start our, our main talk. Um, I'll t tell you what's, what's coming up and then we'll have, have Tom. Uh, we've got a, a lot of social media stuff going on. So um, it's all linked to you from our website, astronomyedinburgh.org, but you can find us on Facebook, um, Twitter, and uh, all our meetings over the last couple of years are also on YouTube. We do have a Flickr group as well, which you'll find um, through there where our members put their images of the night sky. So these are the meetings we've got so far scheduled coming up. On the 2nd of July, we're going to have a talk from Professor Giles Hammond of the University of Glasgow. He's going to be telling us about photometry of short period asteroids. And Alan Pickup will also be doing the sky in July on that meeting. And for members only, on the 7th of July, we have our monthly imaging and observing group meeting. And um, we're not sure what's happening on the 16th of July meeting yet, but um, we may have something there. We'll, we'll, we'll update you when, when we know more about that. Um, we're taking a, a well-earned break off in August because we, as you know, we've been very busy over the last last year or so, and we certainly certainly need a break. Um, we hope to have a, um, a guest speaker on the third of September. We usually do. Um, we, we'll announce that once it's finally confirmed. Uh, on the seventeenth of September, something slightly different: um, exploring astronomy and space through philately. Uh, mm -hmm. Catherine Rena Evans. She she writes for um, various astronomical magazines and um, has an amazing collection of stamps associated with astronomy in space. And I, I've seen some of the, the stuff she writes about it. It's really fascinating. So just a, a, a nice twist on our, our normal meetings. And on the 1st of October, um, astral landscape photography with uh, Mike Shaw. I think he's a professional photographer, Andrew, is that right? Yeah. Um, so wider field of view than we're, we're normally used to doing ourselves. So that, that sounds really interesting as well. Um, that's uh, really it for the in, for the um, preliminaries. Andrew, would you like to introduce? Sure. Me? I, I, I perhaps ought to mention, uh, Mark, just before I, I, I do this, that um, anybody who failed to join us or look at the meeting we had last Tuesday on losing the sky, uh, where we had a, a whole range of professional astronomers and people of interest from lawyers, uh, um, launch uh, specialists, etc., all talking about uh, mega constellations. If you've not seen that, please do. It's on our YouTube uh, on our YouTube channel. Thanks, Mark. Um, well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, over the years, um, I've had an, been part of a number of discussions where people have asked about uh, spectroscopy and how amateurs get involved. So I started looking around uh, at the beginning of the year um, to find uh, who I could uh, call upon to, to help us find a route through. And I came across Tom Field and uh, his great website. So um, I got in touch with Tom and he responded very quickly, which is always a good sign. <laughs> and tonight he's gonna talk to us about um, um, using um, a star analyzer uh, as hardware and some software, which uh, I believe Tom has developed himself, um, enabling you to analyze um, the light from uh, distant objects, be they stars or planets. And um, I'm gonna hand over to Tom. And as usual, if you've got any questions um, and you're participating in Zoom, if you would like to put them in the chat box, um, I'll, uh, I'll call you out at the appropriate time. If you're watching live on YouTube, um, and you want to ask a question, put, you put, it, put it in the, uh, in the comments section. And um, I think we'll all try and, uh, and read out some of those. So I'm going to hand over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to make sure, Andrew, nod your head. You can hear me OK? Great. Thanks a lot. And welcome, everybody. This is a great group, uh, not only on Zoom, but on YouTube. And I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some fun with you all tonight. I'm Tom Field. Uh, I'm a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope magazine here in the US. Uh, I'm a little bit of an imager and much more of a, a software developer and uh, enthusiast and, um, uh, shall we say, uh, um, 
evangelist. I'm always hesitant to use that word in a scientific context, but evangelist. So I figure there's two types of people here, at least. One is somebody who's actually interested in doing spectroscopy. They've got a telescope or they're curious about it. And the others of you are perhaps armchair astronomers. Maybe you don't do any observing at all. Maybe your skies are too polluted. I know somebody on YouTube said they checked, were checking in from Westminster and their skies were, were light polluted. And uh, regardless, uh, even for those of you who don't think you'll ever do this kind of thing, of course, I'd like to convert you to being interested in doing some astronomy on uh, with your own equipment. But uh, so much of the research that's done in the field of astronomy is done using spectroscopy, that understanding a little bit more about it can really elevate your comprehension, our comprehension and appreciation for how that is done. So although I'll be talking about practical spectroscopy tonight, I think that you'll find that you'll gain an understanding and appreciation for for the tools that professionals use. So I'm going to talk for about 50 minutes or so. I hope to keep those of you who are in uh, certain other time zones. I think India is around midnight there. Uh, welcome India. There's one I, I noted here on Aruta Sova near, Ar, uh, near Ardri and others in India. So uh, thanks for the wonderful turnout uh, from all countries, Greece, Italy, uh, and even a couple from here in the US. So uh, let's get started. How have we managed, except for one thing, and that is, I need to start my pointer. There we go. So how is it that we've managed to discover so much about the universe when really we've barely set foot outside our own front door? Uh, now, also, I'm going to tell, you know, I live in Seattle, so I get to complain about Bill Gates for just a moment or Microsoft. Why is it every single time I give a presentation, I have to tell uh, Microsoft PowerPoint to leave my cursor visible? Come on, Bill, you can do better than that. So we've got images, of course, of two dimensions of the universe. And we've also got a fleeting glimpses of a third dimension. This is a rather old image. I should have thrown one in from, uh, from earlier this week, in fact. And if we watch for a while, we get a fourth dimension. And if you look, especially in the upper right-hand corner, if you're having trouble spotting it, you can see some stars changing in brightness. These are, again, a time dimension, right? Uh, these are our, our Lyrae standard candles. And if you spread the colors out, you get an, a fifth dimension, right? I, I love just even the colors aesthetically, the quality of these, the quality is just gorgeous, isn't it? Where does the blue become green? I challenge you <laughs> to tell me that and to, and to have your peers and other members of the club and other attendees to this talk agree. Where is that point? These are nature's colors. They're not some designer's colors. And they really are. They're gorgeous, aren't they? So these gaps in these rainbows from stars reveal something about not only our stars, but other stars' composition. We're going to talk a little bit about tonight. I'm not going to read this bullet list, but we're going to see examples. All of these things that we read about in magazines and online. Uh, I, th I think I'm dating myself when I say magazines. I know some of the younger attendees are going, what? What's a magazine? They're the ones who also say, you used to nail your phones to the wall? <laughs> things change, don't they? So all of these physical uh, properties are typically studied using spectroscopy. So I'm going to do just a little bit of science. Hang in with me here if you're familiar with these, just to get us all to a same, uh, just general working knowledge of things. Sir Isaac Newton discovered that we can split starlight into a rainbow or white light from any source. You can also, in, in addition to a prism, you can bounce that light off a finely grooved surface or even through a finely grooved surface. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Again, just a little bit of history here. Bunsen, many of whom uh, of us have, are familiar with his name, you know, he invented the Bunsen burner to study spectrum. And basically he burnt a sample and then he put the light through a prism and he'd look at the results. One interesting thing about Bunsen as a side note, he never patented his Bunsen burner. He said, I want this to be patent free and available to humanity to further, further all of our well being. 
<laughs> alien concept to the way things happen commercially these days where everything is patented. He'd have a patent on every screw and bolt on that if he had lived today. So another, uh, oh, just one more thing about Bunsen. He was like a pyromaniac. He burnt everything he could get his hands on. And the great thing is he created a catalog of what he saw. And we'll be looking at examples of that in the next few minutes. Kirchhoff was a uh, contemporary. Uh, and we're not going to get into a lot of detail about Kirchhoff, except one quick thing, which will help further on. And that's just over here, this area here. You can see there are two different types of spectrum. The one at the top here has a rainbow, right, in uh, red, orange, yellow order. And there's some gaps in it. And this one down here, I'm, I'm glad I'm not getting graded on penmanship and artistry. This one down here has some emission lines, just bright lines. The interesting thing about this is they're at the same position, regardless of which one we're seeing. We're not going to get into a lot of the details that Kirchhoff discussed about how the temperature of the gas that the light is going through changes uh, and determines which of these things we'll be seeing. So these spectra are chemical fingerprints. That's really the key concept here. And you can see, for example, this helium. Suppose you went to a florist and got one of those balloons that they blow up uh, with helium. You know, If you were to safely burn that gas you, and look at the results through a prism, you would see something that looked like this. So hydrogen has different lines, right? So they really are fingerprints. Now, hydrogen is so frequently studied that its lines we gave some names to. Uh, first, the, the collection is called the hydrogen bomber line series. And then we can see this bright red line is hydrogen alpha. And this one, what color is that? That's, let's call that robin egg blue to be really, really scientific, okay? And uh, you can see Greek letters just for names, much like up until the last year, I would say much like we named the stars and the constellations. Now we can say, as of recently, we can say much as we name variants in COVID, but Let's not go there, okay? So this is a poster that actually, which uh, we created, uh, a lot of teachers buy this from us. Uh, the reason I have it here is just to again, show you the nature of these fingerprints. You can see there's our hydrogen alpha, right? That red line. And there's our hydrogen beta, that robin egg blue line and so forth. Very different than the helium lines that we'd get from burning uh, the gas in a balloon. It's a cool poster. Uh, and my only, my only claim, the only celebrity I've ever met, Neil deGrasse Tyson told me that he has this poster hanging on his office wall. I'm, I'm proud of that. I actually am. It's also on the Sophia uh, 747 Airborne Telescope uh, airplane, which is pretty cool. So this is a view from software, but I wanted to show you that, uh, again, here are some lines. There's that robin egg blue. Uh, we don't have to burn you know, things like Bunsen did. These days, we can just use gas tubes. I've got one over here. I didn't actually prepare for this. Let's see if I can get it to turn on. There we go. So that's a gas tube. Uh, that happens to be helium. It's safe. Even uh, a knuckle dragging programmer like me can use it without burning down the lab or the house, okay? So we also developed, just in passing, to mention this little tripod mounted spectrometer for educators. And we have a lot of these all over the world. Lots of universities and high schools use these to study spectra, sometimes then transitioning into astronomical spectroscopy. So, so far, all of the astronomers that I've mentioned have been what? Old white men, right? Of which I am a member. Let's look at some of the other greats in the field who have done just, just stunningly exciting spectroscopy and, and other things. Annie Jump Cannon, just real briefly here, and her team of computers, they were prohibited from touching the telescopes at Harvard. So they ended up studying the glass plates of spectra. And they were really, really good at what they did. And not only did they classify literally hundreds of thousands of spectra more than 100 years ago, but they also came up with a star classification scheme that actually worked unlike <laughs> all the previous ones created by, I suppose, old white men. Really uh, just pioneers in the field. Priyamvada Nataraja, is, uh, uh, she's at Dartmouth and she studies uh, gravitational lensing uh, and, um, and black holes. Nancy Grace Roman, uh, who has a, now a telescope named after her, was the first professional astronomer at NASA. She got her PhD in the late 1940s. 
as a woman, that was really, I'm sure there were a lot of obstacles in her way. She was a big, big proponent of the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which is in the sick bay right now. We're wishing it well for recovery. Um, and uh, she actually helped make the Hubble happen. Elisa Quintana, uh, she studies uh, exoplanets and has discovered some in the Goldilocks region around some red giants. And Jedediah Eisler is at Dartmouth and she studies a uh, hypermassive black hole. So again, this is a fun slide for me to put together last year. Uh, there are just so many women and, and other uh, minorities who have done uh, just stunning work. And I thought it was important to bring them to our attention. Tonight, I'm going to talk about this star analyzer grading. It's just an inch and a quarter grading. It's actually made in the UK. You can see that down there. We sell it here in the US and internationally. If you're in the UK, you'd buy it there. So this grading, it's like 195 US dollars and, and uh, Great British pounds uh, without the customs fee, even less in the UK. And it's really remarkable what we can do with it. I'll tell you a little bit about my story later on this evening. Uh, or this morning or whatever time zone you're in. Here are some examples of how you can use the grading. Here it's just mounted on the lens cap threads of a DSLR. Now we also sell this little adapter for the threads. That's an arrow. That's There we go, a little bit more of an arrow. So you can actually, it, tracking is pretty important. Uh, even with a DSLR, you can, without tracking, you can get spectra, but it's a little more challenging. But this is a really inexpensive way to get started. And you can get excellent spectra, even with not much aperture. This is an example of just any old Fitz camera, color or mono, doesn't matter, cooled or not. Uh, and I've got one here to wave around you, but it's uh, missing in action. Uh, but you get the idea down here, just uh, any old video camera. Uh, and here is an example of a uh, grading mounted in, um, in a filter wheel. So there's, if you have a telescope today and you're doing any imaging, it's really easy to get started in this. That's, I think one, oh yeah, I was going to mention, I used to have a slide that listed all the key points that I wanted to make. I thought, I'll just tell people what, what I think is important. But not only don't people like reading bullets, but I was getting bored with those slides. And so I, I'm going to try this. I have this little signal here. This is a ding moment. And that means that it's something from that slide of important points that I wanted to make. And one is that with almost any equipment, you can do this kind of thing. And I think a lot of us, uh, including me, when we get started or are contemplating getting started in something new, we expect it to be expensive. Well, I've already eliminated that obstacle by mentioning the cost of the grading. And the software is $109. And uh, also we're concerned about the, the challenges technically and getting it, making the system all set up and getting back focus right. All that's easy. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, uh, it's really, really pretty easy to get started, especially if you're already an imager. You can piggyback your DSLR on your telescope if you want. By the way, one of the things I meant to mention, uh, whether it's our Westminster friend watching on YouTube or others, I think I can safely say that just about everybody listening to this talk has light pollution problems, right? It's unfortunate, sad, but true. The thing I wanted to mention, and this is one of those <laughs> ding moments too, and that is spectroscopy is much less affected by light pollution than other imaging. Why would that be? Well, because with visual imaging, we're really concerned about gradient and you know color authenticity, all of those kinds of things. But with spectroscopy, we're really just looking for patterns like deep dips, as we'll see in the graphs in a moment. So a lot of amateurs have discovered that, well, they'll go out to their dark sky site on weekends if the weather's good. But if, if they've got a setup around the home or they wheel it out into their driveway or on the roof of their flat, they can actually do some fun science with their equipment. So that's, I mean, really, that's a pretty big deal for all of us as, as observing gets more and more challenging due to light pollution. Okay, so we're done with all of that history, theory, equipment. What can we actually do? Well, again, we take the starlight, we put it through a grating, and we get this rainbow that falls on our sensor. So this spectrum is what we're studying. Here's a just a spectacularly great example. These are separate spectra captured at different times 
of different stars. And this was done, by the way, on an eight inch Newtonian with an imaging source video camera. I'm sort of jumping around in my seat because I just, I'm still stunned at, at what's possible with such simple gear. This is done by a guy named Torsten Hansen. Now, earlier in one of those slides with bullets, I mentioned the uh, temperature differences of stars and being able to measure them or the material composition. So ding moment, because you can see with these different star types, different patterns in those gaps in the spectra. We're actually measuring with a video camera, something about these stars. Now they're in temperature order, starting uh, with the hottest B and then going down all the way down here to type K and M stars. I'm gonna look at just two quick patterns with you here and then we'll move on. Notice down here, we've got, if I get my right buttons, we've got these patterns here. Those aren't even lines, are they? Those are like forests of lines. On these cooler stars, we can see the spectra from some of the more complex molecules surrounding those stars on the surface. These happen to be titanium oxide, but uh, to be frank with you, I don't know anything more about them. Again, one of the great things about, again, not only having the web, but, but these days is there's not gonna be, you're never gonna be quizzed on spectroscopy if you're, you're learning it. And there's lots of resources to help you learn. So you learn what you want to learn. And I just chose not to delve into much about what causes these, except the interesting thing is these are cool stars. Relatively cool stars allow these complex molecules to survive without getting burnt up. The other place to, I wanted to show you right here was that feature. Now this is uh, what, that's robin egg blue color and this is the hydrogen beta line that I mentioned earlier. Notice that it's darkest here on this type A star, like what Vega or Sirius uh, for Northern Hemisphere observers. Notice it's not so strong here on these hot type B stars or on these cooler stars and it, it doesn't really even exist down here. What's, what's going on here? This is a, a temperature phenomena we're seeing here. So quick review of how these spectra get caused, how these gaps are caused. In the Bohr model of the atom, we have electrons orbiting in electron shells, right? In certain quantized levels. And sometimes they jump. And when they jump, they absorb energy when they're jumping up. So when, when in hydrogen, an electron that's, that's been sitting in this orbit two jumps to orbit four, it absorbs light right in this robin egg blue hydrogen bomber line. That's really all there is to it. The stunning thing is that you think about how small an atom is. You know, there's like a million of them across a human hair in size. And yet that microscopic phenomena, we can observe with these coarse, and as we get older, coarser and coarser human eyes. The, the, just the scale of observation. Of course, we can also observe macrocosmic scale. We can observe galaxies, but it is stunning that we can observe and uh, gather data about these transitions. So those transitions are causing all of these lines. Now, listen, this is definitely a, a ding moment. And that is, I'm not an astrophysicist. I'm not a PhD in, in chemistry or any of those things. So if a knuckle dragging programmer can learn this over time, then really anybody can learn it. Again, you don't have to go into all the nitty gritty details to really have a lot of fun and understand what we're seeing. So do you see in that crosshairs right down here, maybe you can see it's dimmed just a little bit. Suppose the Hubble Space Telescope people made a huge mistake and gave me time on, on the Hubble Space Telescope. And I captured the spectrum of Vega. And I wrote a paper and said, yeah, we saw a little bit of dimming in the robin egg blue. That's not a publishable paper, is it? So we need to migrate from qualitative colors to quantitative. And we do that by graphing the intensity of this region. So it's pretty straightforward, stick with me here. And that is the star is, is really bright and narrow, right? So this peak here is very bright, that's intensity in that dimension, and it's pretty narrow in width. Whereas this thing over here, right, it's pretty dim out here on the wings and pretty bright in the middle. So it starts out dim, dim, brighter, 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 dimmer, 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 right? 
but look at this. That little dimming you may be able to spot there shows up as a deep dip. This is fantastic because now we can do science, right? Now we can measure the depth of that, the width of that, where is it located, how's it compared to other stars or the same star the next night, or maybe it's a nova and it's changing. Now we're cooking with gas, so to speak. So how do we get that graph? So my story is I wanted to do this. I, I got a grading from Patton Hawksley there in the UK in 2009. I, I, to be honest, I was not much of an imager. I just never really captured my attention. It seemed like uh, uh, it took too much time uh, for very subtle uh, changes in, in what I was producing. I'm glad that there are others who feel otherwise and produce these wonderful images that we see. I got a grading. I went out in my backyard here in Seattle, right outside that window. I'm three miles from downtown Seattle. If you're familiar with our tourist locations, Pike Place Market. I went out at midnight with my C8 and uh, uh, actually it was just a grading that I attached. I used actually the, um, a, just I took apart a nose piece and I duct taped it to a, Log a Logitech webcam. And this is literally the spectrum that I captured. I'll show you another example in, the mo in a moment. I came in at midnight, you know, my blue jean, my, the knees of my blue jeans were all grass stained, right? Because it was August and you know, it's Vega after all in the Northern hemisphere. So the next morning, Sunday morning, I said, okay, now I'm gonna create a graph, this will be great. I downloaded some of the free software that was out there. And about two hours later, I quit, I gave up. I, I really, I'm sort of bragging because I, I just did not have the patience. Uh, you know, learning new software shouldn't be painful. And this software at the time, it was crashing and then to add insult to injury, it was that error messages were in French. So, I gave up. I told my wife, this is a hobby. I'm supposed to be having fun. And so I, I took my star analyzer grading and I put it in the drawer. But it kept weighing on me over the next week or two. I kept thinking about it in idle moments. I decided, okay, next Saturday, I'm just going to write something to create this curve. And I did. Sunday morning, it was done. And now 10 or 15,000 hours of programming later, the software is almost done. There's lots and lots of people using the software now, but you know they say that any software that's done is is uh, archaic and out of date. So uh, it's been a lot of fun for me. What my wife keeps saying: Would you finish the software so we can start having dinner at a, at a regular and normal time? So now, as I mentioned, and this is definitely a ding moment. You know. I think actually just a side statement here. When I look down that way, you know I'm reaching for my dinger. I'm sort of telegraphing where I'm headed. So I'm gonna give this up and I'm just gonna mention ding moments from now on. Anybody who joins late is gonna wonder what's a ding moment. So I think we all understandably are hesitant to embark on a new software program uh, learning curve because we've been up that learning curve before, right? So I felt the same way. I, I know better than to do a full software demonstration right now. I mean, for those of you in Europe, you've already had your dinner. And for those of you on Zoom, I, my Zoom screen's over here, I begin to see your, your live video feed. You know, I begin to start seeing the tops of your head and hearing your forehead hit your microphones as you nod off to sleep. But I think it's important that you see how easy this stuff is because uh, that's something which, uh, again, can eliminate some of the obstacles in getting started. So this is my software. This is a view. It's a frozen frame from a live video on a color camera. Color isn't as sensitive and can introduce other challenges, but I like color because it's much more intuitive, especially if you're doing outreach. You can see there's a gap there and maybe some gaps there. Uh, so all I do to study the spectrum is just take these lines and bracket the data that I want to study this is literally a frame from that first night I was out, and there's our spectrum. So this peak here is the star, right? <laughs> Even though I didn't get it circled very well. And this data over here with all those gaps or dips is this data. So that dark gap there is that, and that's actually a water in the atmosphere or oxygen, one or the other. So what do we do with this? So, so what? We've got that, we've got these dips. What, what value is that? Well, remember I mentioned that Bunsen kept a catalog of everything he burnt. And the great, 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 great grand catalog 
still exists and is used today and it's built into our software. So here's, here's a little index of that catalog and I can come down here and ask the software, show me on the graph where the hydrogen bomber lines would be. And you can see here, we've got some matches where all of these dips, there's one in Robin Egg Blue, for example, match the reference lines that Bunsen told us about. That's pretty remarkable. First time out with a video camera in a city to be able to detect the hydrogen on Vega. <coughs> so now somebody's mic is um, uh, unmuted. You might try muting yourself if that's you. So that's really all I wanted to show you here is how easy it is to get started. There's two other quick things that are sort of fun. One is this is actually a frozen frame from a video I recorded at two frames per minute that first night out. I'm gonna play it here. Let's just start play. Now you can see the image over here at two frames a second is jumping around, so so is our spectrum. Let's turn that fill off, make it a little easier to see. You can see it's jumping around. Some of the frames are better than others. We can stack them if we want, and that's what this button here does, is turns on stacking. Watch how quickly it stabilizes with stacking. At two frames per second, it just took us five frames. So this is a video from that first night out, and, and these are the kinds of videos that you can produce for yourself. So uh, in, in uh, leaving this screen, the only thing I'd ask you is if you would uh, just in your mind's eye, if I can get the right control key, remember that view just in your mind's eye, because we're going to revisit that view a little bit further down the way uh, in reference to a great discovery that was made in the field a long time ago. So let me uh, come back here and move on. Now, you know, I mentioned earlier outreach. Here's a great outreach event. Uh, it's actually in France. In, uh, you can see up here on the projected screen and, and they're going to do spectroscopy. This is actually gas tubes they're starting with here outside these dorms, you know, in a, a relatively urban locations. This is the kind of thing. And for those of you who do outreach, uh, this kind of screen is really captivating, especially if it's moving, like you're playing a video or real time. People want to know what they're seeing and it gives you an opportunity to augment the outreach that you're already doing uh, with a little more science. Uh, set up a second telescope and uh, again, you don't have to be uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson or, or uh, any of those luminaries in order to explain this sufficiently to keep people interested and involved. So here's a spectrum, a wide field uh, image. You can see here, here's some stars, here there's spectra, there's some gaps. Here's a star, there's some, some lumps, shall we call those lumps? Those are saturated pixels. In fact, let's look a little more deeply at a wolf a star. Now I have a confession to make. Oh, and, and I didn't cherry pick uh, these uh, examples. Janet uh, is, is from the, over there, uh, uh, somewhere over there in the UK. So, when she sent me this, I couldn't remember what a wolf a star was, honestly. You know, I look, we've all for years and years read about all these kinds of things, and often they go in one ear and out the other. Well, the reason I mentioned that is, and this is definitely a ding moment, what I found is when you get the data in your hands, especially if it's your own data, it sticks, and you get curious about it in ways that otherwise you wouldn't be. And so Wikipedia tells us that a wolf a star is a late stage star. It's got really strong stellar winds. Here's the spectrum of it. You can see here some peaks, carbon, carbon, carbon. This is probably headed to being a supernova, but why carbon? Well, remember stars fuse through the elements and part of that process involves carbon. And so we're at that particular evolutionary stage. So now we're looking at something about the the life cycle and the evolution of stars with a DSLR on a tracking mount with mechanical tracking in this case, nothing expensive. Remarkable, huh? What about another emission object? Here's our beloved M57. And with a slitless grating, that's what you see. We can see a couple elements, right? Uh, some hydrogen and some ionized oxygen. That's what that Roman numeral three means. It just means some electrons were pulled out. But almost every other extended object, when you look at it with a star analyzer grading, is just going to be mush. So if we want to look at extended objects, then we really need to use a higher resolution slit device. And you can see here some examples here. These are made in France. They're considerably more expensive. <clears throat> there is a 3D printed version of these that uh, is a little less expensive of a slit device. But the learning curve is enormously steep because now you're guiding 
uh, and acquiring a target on a 20 micron slit. So nobody really starts at this level. It's a big learning curve if you do. So, but here is an emission object, our beloved M42 on a slit spectrometer. Notice we have hydrogen alpha emission lines. There's our ionized oxygen with that Roman numeral three. This is a really, you know, really broad object, right? It's not a compact star. So uh, in smaller meetings, sometimes, especially in person, I'll ask for people to volunteer their experience the first time. And I'll ask you, just think about it for a moment. If you have the first time you saw M42, when that was. For me, I was in Denver in 1993 or so. I wanted to do some astronomy because Shoemaker Levy 9 was coming. I'd read about it. I had no idea what it was, this was all about. I went out to the Denver Astronomical Society's uh, first quarter star party in the city. I parked my car and walked up on the small berm next to the observing field and I looked down. You know, it's interesting to remember before you knew something. Uh, we can't remember what, before we knew how to walk, right? That's too old. But in this case, what I remember is I looked down on that observing field and what I saw, you know those cannons that they shoot people out of at circuses? That's, that's what I thought I was seeing. I'm thinking, what are, what are they doing with all these cannons out here? Of course, they were Dobsonians, but I didn't know any better. So I queued up. Somebody much like many of you or me were operating one of their Dobbs. They were pointed at M42. I queued up. Uh, I was really excited to see what they were, were talking about. When I got to the eyepiece, I was really disappointed. I'm being honest here. I just, it was a smudge. It was like a little fuzzy, foggy smudge. Why would I care? Um, I still go back and look at M42. Thank goodness I stuck with it. And I bet many of you had a similar experience and also still look at M42. Why would we still look at M42 if it's just a smudge? Well, of course, now we've got dark sky sites. We've got better telescopes. The other thing is we know how to use averted vision, right? So we know how to use our peripheral vision here to observe things with the more sensitive part of our eyes, right? And so, but in honesty, I would say, and this is a ding moment I was leading up to, the more we understand about what we're observing, the more interesting that visual observation is. And so for us, we now understand that this is a stellar nursery, the birthplace of stars, right? And so now bringing that knowledge to the eyepiece, it's a richer experience. And the reason I mention that is that's what spectroscopy has done for me and could do for you, is it really deepens your understanding of what we're observing. So I'm gonna race through some quick examples here. Uh, and this is again by Torsten Hansen with a video camera, and that's the spectrum of Uranus and Neptune. And down here, we can see this deep dip. This is a band of lines. Earlier, I mentioned that bands of lines on cool stars are the result of a more complex molecule instead of just a simple element like hydrogen or helium. What kind of complex molecule, molecule <laughs> that's easy for me to say, right? Would we be seeing on Neptune and Uranus? Well, methane. We're seeing with a backyard telescope, the methane on those planets. Now, you know, this is probably a good moment to mention that my wife is always encouraging me to dress for success. Somehow, I don't think this is what she meant. In fact, I know this isn't something she meant because she has told me repeatedly when she glances in my office door here, she assures me this isn't what she meant. But look, you can see there's the hydrogen beta there. Uh, you can see it and down, down deep in there is that uh, it's no longer RGB, it's now monochrome grayscale, right? Now, I know over the last year, some of, last year, some of you have experienced what I'm about to describe, and that is my salon wasn't answering the phone for a while, and then they didn't have appointments. And I mean, it's, so that gray just kept building up, right? Actually, I'm just jealous. I don't have a gray problem. But... Uh, I mentioned that because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the color spectrum for outreach and for learning is much more effective. By the way, in terms of learning, just a thing to mention, and that is, once you have a little bit of experience with this, this is the kind of thing, uh, as we get back to normal, uh, normal life post-COVID, that you can do with high schools. Chemistry teachers, physics teachers, astronomy teachers, spectra is all, I mean, especially chemistry. This is all chemistry. You can go into a school and instead of just showing, you know, there's M13, there's the moon, you can do a little science. It's a, it really is, a, it's not a carte blanche, but it is an entree to going into classrooms because it gives you a little more science to present. 
1881, our Henry Draper of the Draper Catalog uh, observed a comet. <coughs> Heck, if Henry can do it, so can we. <coughs> here down in the lower left, we can see this really uh, string of gems. And over here, we can see the emission features graphed in the software of the swan bands. <coughs> Excuse me. This was captured by Vikrant Agnihotris in Rajasthan. And uh, in 2013, he was a newcomer. Now he, he's an expert. He's really gone far beyond what I know. And uh, as a teacher, I love that. What teacher doesn't love that? He did this, as you can see, with just an 80 millimeter refractor and a Canon camera. So it's possible. Now, give me a moment. There we go. So here's a more recent example. Oh, and I have a little pop up there. Here's a more recent example of Neil Wise. Now, this is sort of interesting. This is, this is by Robin Leadbeater. He's the designer of the star analyzer there in the UK. And he took a star analyzer and he put it on a, on a video camera. And what I like about this is, you know, anybody who uses a C-clamp as part of their, their kit, that's my kind. Of, and actually, they're far better than I am because if it was me, I would have cranked that C-clamp down so much, I would have collapsed the camera enclosure. So he's studying meteors. And this is the meteor track, this thing right here. And this is the spectrum here with a brightening, some sort of bolide right there. And here's the spectrum that he got. So that dip right there is that gap right there. This is like, if spectroscopy is a niche activity, you know, I used entree and carte blanche, you know, I, I was a little worried with the British audience that, that you know, I'd be overstepping my bounds there. But um, uh, I think I'll avoid the, uh, the foreign words that are still identifiable as foreign. But I've started to say, if spectroscopy is a niche or niche activity, then meteor spectroscopy is really, it's like a niche in a niche. But Robin really is remarkable. Not only to design the star analyzer, he supports people on our online forum uh, and is really uh, at the pro-am level. He does a lot of really remarkable work and has been a big, uh, uh, help to the entire community and a leader, and has helped me a great deal in, in, in my exposure. I'm not going to get a lot into uh, the solar spectrum, except to note that uh, uh, these two gentlemen observed that feature in 1868, and they didn't know what it was, and it was 40 or 50 years later that we found uh, on Earth what that was uh, from, and that was helium. So it's a longer and fun story, but I hate to steal the fire for those of you who haven't heard it, and, uh, and review it for those of you who've had. So uh, if you're into studying novae, you can study the differences of them. You can see here, even with the Canon camera, you can do that. Okay, real brief uh, review of uh, Doppler shift if you're not familiar with it. I think one of the best examples is uh, like when a fire engine goes by and it's got its bell and it's going ding, 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 except that's not what we hear, is it? What we hear is ding, 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 right? Or a train. That change in pitch as it goes past us, coming towards us, coming towards us, going away, going away, that's Doppler shift. The waves are as if stretched when it's moving away from us and compressed when it's coming towards us, as if. Same thing happens with light. So if we were expecting a spectrum with this triplet, I like that word. I don't know what was an Anglo-Saxon word. I, I don't know what language it's from. And I'm going to uh, now, if, if because I've got a color camera, you may be able to see me blushing because this, this routine isn't working, this language thing. It's the first time I've tried it. But triplet's a great word because uh, it's self-defining, right? So if we were expecting it there and we saw it over to the side, we could say that object is moving away from us. The light is red shifted like the sound of the car horn or the train bell. Ding, 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 ding. And if the, the feature was shifted the other direction and blue shifted, we know it was moving towards us. Look at this great example. Now, a lot of us are familiar with uh, supernova. I'm not going to get into the details, except occasionally, a large star's gas ends up on a small star. And when you pour gas on a star or a hot surface, what happens? It explodes. There's lots of different ways that stars can uh, explode as supernovae. Uh, this is called a type 1a star when it involves two stars. Here's a great example from M101. There it is. And this is a photograph of a, a different supernova than this one. Uh, one that was local, but we can see that there's, you know, after time, there's somewhat of a shell. There's some actual size there. It's not just a dot of light, is it? 
So there's the spectrum. Now, David Strange in the UK with his C9, you can see down there, in less than 15 minutes of integration time, created this graph in the software. Now, that dip, barely discernible, is really clear here. Now, you know that expression, we stand on the uh, shoulders of giants, and, and today it's, it's as true or more true than ever. When I was getting my COVID vaccination, uh, the doctor who was about to inject it, I said to him, whether it's a pump handle or whether it's uh, this injection, the science behind this is what has elevated humanity to the levels that it is. Now, the pump handle is a pump handle from, uh, from England and the beginning of epidemiology. If you Google pump handle and, and epidemiology, you'll see a fascinating story about the origins of the field. The giants upon whose shoulders we stand in astronomy have figured out that different types of supernovae have different spectroscopic signatures. Without getting into the details, see that deep dip right there, a little bit above 6,000? That's ionized silicon, like beet sand. Now, these other supernovas don't have that deep dip there. So this signature, that deep dip, just a little bit above 6,000, helps us identify this as a type 1A supernova. That's one of the things that amateurs have been able to contribute over the years uh, to uh, pro-am collaborations as those kinds of detections, even today. So I want to show you something pretty cool. This is just real fast here. David and I measured this x-axis value for that dip at about 6150, right? So we plug that in here. If Bunsen had burnt beach sand, he would have found uh, a line at, at rest at 6355 on that x-axis. Now, believe me, I didn't know the Doppler shift formula. I had forgotten it if I ever had used it, but Wikipedia is our friend. And fortunately, it just involves a multiplication and a division and a subtraction. When we plug those numbers in, we have now calculated the blue shift of the shell of that supernova coming towards us. There should be a lot of wows here. One is, wow, that's fast. Notice I'm trying to speak to international audiences, the same part of the world here and those who uh, are living in the past. There should be another wow because it's astonishing we were able to do this kind of thing with a backyard telescope to measure the, the shell of that supernova coming towards us. So in 2011, Adam Rees, he, he and his team won the Nobel Prize for work that they've done on accelerating expansion of the universe. And guess what type of stars they used as standard candles? Type 1a supernovae. Somehow I don't think he used a star analyzer grading, but in bang for your buck, we've got them beat, I'm convinced. So, you know, 150 pounds or so for this kind of data as, as compared to the millions of dollars of telescopes he was using. So what about the spectrum of a quasar, of a black hole? Well, of course, it's a black hole. It's not emitting light, but the light circling around it uh, or the matter circling around it, uh, the accretion disk is getting very hot and it does have a spectrum. So David Hayworth here in Portland, Oregon, here on the West Coast of the US, he captured this image. There's the quasar and there's the spectrum with two little dots of light. You can barely see them. Let's blow them up. There they are. So, and when we put that into software, we see two peaks. So this guy, Martin Schmidt, in the 1960s was in his mid-19 or mid-20s. He was in his mid-20s. And again, in person, I love to call out and, and not uh, embarrass, but just point out to the teenagers in the audience that uh, this guy was only a decade older than them. He looked at this spectrum and like a good scientist, he wanted to know what these peaks were. And so like many scientists do, he compared an unknown to a known. This is the unknown. What's the known? Oh, it's that mind's eye spectrum I asked you to remember from my software. There's the hydrogen alpha. There's that hydrogen beta dip in the robin egg blue and so forth, a bomber series. He went, oh, those don't match, do they? You know, this dip here doesn't match any of these. These dips, there's none over here. Where's that? He went, well, at least I know it's not hydrogen, right? except he figured it out. It was hydrogen, massively redshifted by cosmological expansion. So this object, um, again, published figure is that, and we got pretty close on this, didn't we? 
So we were able to calculate the Hubble constant or use the Hubble constant to determine the distance of this object. Now, two quick examples, I, I think is one of the things that we all love in astronomy, I think is just appreciating the enormity of time and space compared to this pale blue dot upon which we live. So for this quasar to be as bright as it is at that enormous distance I'm pointing out there is if that's where it is, it would have to be a hundred times brighter than all the stars in our Milky Way galaxy combined. The second example, if this supernova was where Pollux is, and Pollux is, I don't know how far Pollux is from us, but you know, it's a relatively local star. It would be almost as bright as our sun. This baby is bright. So the thing that I find fascinating is that this light that is so old still has information in it. We can still learn something. It's as if that light didn't age, isn't it? Humans don't age as well, do they? Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. And I've been justly accused of throwing him under the bus here, but it's really, as I mentioned earlier, it's just envy. He's still got his full head of hair. I'm, I'm uh, not quite as fortunate. So last examples here. Uh, again, suppose we wanted to study these dips in detail. That's the hydrogen, alpha, beta, and gamma. Well, so far we're looking, uh, how wide are these dips? If I just drop a line here, they're about 50 angstroms wide. Now, if I wanted to look at the details of that, I can't, wouldn't it be nice if I could just use my mouse roller wheel to, to scroll, scroll in, to, to zoom in. But it, that would be much like just, you know, putting more and more magnification on the moon when we're observing it. At some point, it's just empty magnification, right? The data is just not there to support that additional magnification. So to get additional details, that's when we do jump into those slit devices. Now, this is definitely a ding moment because Almost every example I've shown you has been tonight with the star analyzer grading, with the exception of M42 and the two I'm going to show you. I think a lot of the time we, we look at these images. In fact, uh, if in person or I, sometimes I'll do it in smaller groups. I don't have one here. If I had an astronomy magazine, uh, wherever it was published, like, I'll ask somebody, just pull one out of your bag and turn to the back and look at some of those gorgeous images. You know, hold it up, show it to us and then read the fine print and it's 20 hours of integration time, 20 hours. I know you all uh, in Europe, especially in Northwest or Europe have, have pretty crummy weather as we do here in Seattle. Some summers, I don't even get that much imaging time in a month or two, cause it's cloudy and rainy or, or it's not dark enough. I'm glad that these people spend that time producing those beautiful images. The reason I mentioned this as a ding moment is because as I showed you earlier, a lot of these images come from videos and they're not 10 and 20,000 images stacked. It's a handful or DSLRs. So you don't need that kind of high powered equipment to do these kinds of things. But these two last two examples, uh, you do need the more expensive slit spectrometer. There's Vega with the, and that dip is that dip. You can see we've zoomed in on it. And let's compare it to something known more close, the moon. Now the moon's not moving appreciably towards or from us. And look at the difference there. We're able to measure the Doppler shift of a star by comparing it to a known relatively stationary object. That's pretty cool. Last example of the night, and I've got a little visual aid. Stick with me here. So this is a basketball. We have to be uh, uh, geocentric here. I suppose this should be a, a football or a rugby ball. So. This is a star that's rotating very quickly. That means that this edge is coming towards you and this edge is moving away from you, right? Rotating very quickly. So let's, uh, let's look at that graphically. That means if the star is rotating like that, this edge is blue shifted, the light as, as it's coming towards you is blue shifted and the light over on this, this side is red shifted. So instead of seeing this kind of deep dip on a star that's not rotating quickly, here's what we'd see on Altair. Notice that dip is gone mostly. It's not as sharp because some of that light has been red shifted and blue shifted. So this is how the giants upon, as I mentioned, whose shoulders we stand, it's amazing that they figured this kind of thing out. Who would think that just by looking at the colors of a star, you could tell how it was rotating. So to finish up now, um, how do you get started? 
Well, a diffraction grading, I mentioned that, any sort of camera, color, mono. You need some software, that's my software. This is really, uh, a, this is a software that I used years ago that I started on that I mentioned. Uh, uh, Valerie, as well as uh, Christian, great software, it's improved a lot, uh, relatively steep learning curve and so forth. Um, and you may need an adapter or a spacer. And that's because this distance, while not critical, needs to be within a certain range. And on my site, uh, as well as Patton Hawksley that links to my site, uh, we've got a little calculator where you plug in your data and it will show you some green stars over here to tell you whether you've got that distance right. I, a lot of people just send me their equipment list using this link and I just figure it out for them and let them know what they need. There's some great books out there uh, on my site under links. Uh, we talk about this book in particular. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful book, uh, which I wish I had remembered to pull off my shelf before I started here. But uh, I think we'll, I won't pull it off because I can't find it, but I wanted to show you this page at least. Notice all the detail there. Now he has a high resolution uh, spectrometer, but this is fantastic reading. Uh, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't know why there's nitrogen on this star, but the text in his book explains it. And it explains it for people like us. It's, it's not explaining it to a PhD postdoc or uh, astrophysics major. He's explaining it to amateurs because the author is an amateur. Wonderful book. So we have a great online forum. The BAA has a spectroscopy forum, also a very active group. Um, again, the AVSO here in the US, like the BAA, has a, an online database uh, of spectra that you can contribute to, and uh, those can be used by professionals. Uh, about three years ago, I gave an in-person uh, workshop to 100 AVSO members, and the cool thing is they recorded it. It's on YouTube for free. And at our download page here, you can not only download a free copy of the software that's uh, good for 30 days, but also the data that I used in that workshop. So tomorrow morning, you could download the software and the data and then watch that YouTube video and go through a dry lab, go through the process of processing spectra, even if you never did it on your own with your own data. There are opportunities for ProAm collaboration, uh, more coming soon, we hope. Uh, this is a professional uh, at the University of Colorado, Olivier's in France. Uh, these are mostly, there's Christian Will. Some of you may know some of these people's names. So we've come a long way in the last uh, 55 minutes. I went a little over, I apologize. We've also come a long way in the last two or 300 years. Uh, I wanna thank you all for uh, occasionally laughing at my jokes, those of you whose video feeds I can see. Uh, <clears throat> I'd also like to thank all of you who are doing outreach. You know. By virtue of the fact that you are listening to this talk, we know in a really positive way and a good way that, that you've had a privileged life. You were able to take advantage of opportunities that were presented to you to attend lectures like this and to, to enjoy this field and the science behind it. By giving back, by doing outreach, we can repay some of that debt. So not only, you know, sometimes repaying debt is painful, sometimes doing good is painful, Outreach is anything but painful. It's so nourishing to show somebody something they've never seen before. Uh, and again, uh, thank you all who, who are doing that today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll let the uh, meeting organizers uh, take over. Thank you, Tom, that, that was fantastic. Before we move on to questions, can we all un unmute and show our appreciation for Tom? <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tom. That was, that was fascinating. It really well explained. I, I think I saw a comment pop up on YouTube saying, Tom Field rocks at explaining anything. Please, can you narrate some books? <laughs> <laughs> I wait, I have to grab that screen capture and then print it out and put it on, show it to my wife. <laughs> and <laughs> Andrew, would you like to, to bring out some questions, please? Yeah, I'll do that. Uh, I'll do that, Mark. Um, in fact, yours, yours was the first one up. Oh, on the, uh, <laughs> okay. All right. On Zoom, so I'll let you ask yours. Okay, thanks. Oh, okay, so there's a, a new Nova in Hercules at the moment. Yes. Um, what would we, we be seeing and how, how can we contribute to the sum of knowledge about that, that Nova? With, with That's a really good question. On our forum, on our site, is an is a ongoing thread of people who've been posting that and looking at the differences over time. I think looking at the differences is one of the key ways that we can contribute uh, with a time series. Uh, and uh, I know that people are posting those spectra uh, at the BAA database. Uh, and uh, it, it's an exciting uh, NOVA. And there's lots of interesting speculation as to what we're seeing. It's a great question. Thank you. OK, uh, Bruce. Uh... 
You want to find with yours? Oh yes, thanks. Uh, I, I, Tom, I early. I, you may have answered my question, but early in the lecture, you casually put all the hydrogen lines onto one of the spectra that you had, but you didn't actually mention that you had to redshift them to put them on there or blue shift them for the, uh, if it was coming towards us. But you talked about redshifting and blue shifting later in the lecture. Yeah. I assume that early in the lecture, uh, you were just showing that we could do this, but we would have to redshift later. That's a good, oh, good question. Um, most of the time for amateurs, the redshift and the blue shift is so small, you know, unless we're looking at a quasar that's so distant. But most of the time when we're looking at spectra, they're, they're you know, in the Milky Way. And so the redshift and blue shift is below the resolution that we have. So it doesn't, it doesn't encumber us. Now, when we have a slit spectrometer that can change for the better, because then we can get uh, other interesting data. For example, with a slit spectrometer, you can look at one side of Saturn's rings and then the other. And much like that star we were seeing a, a few moments ago, you can calculate the rotational speed of uh, Saturn's ring. It's a good question. I should connect those a little bit better, Bruce. I appreciate your asking it that way. So it's kind of a resolution issue. Uh, yeah. You get yeah. less resolution, but the... But you know, by the way, thanks for the talk. It was really good. Thank you. Uh, Ramsey, would you like to ask yours? Yeah, I was just wondering how many lines per inch the, the grating was. That's a good question. So uh, the, the, the star analyzer gratings come in 100 and 200 line per millimeter uh, grating lines. And that's important when we're mounting it, as I mentioned earlier, when we're mounting a grating on a camera, we want the distance to be approximately right. And so most of the time it's a star analyzer 100, sometimes it's a 200, and that's what the calculator on, on our site and Patton Hawksley site helps us figure out. And uh, it's, a, it's a minor technical detail. It's like, I understand there in Europe you call, uh, you have something called a sleeping policeman. We call them speed bumps here. We're much more civilized than sleeping policemen. But it, it's, it's a little bit of an obstacle to getting started to have to think about, is it 100, is it 200? But it is an important technical detail uh, that I help people get past so that they can get onto the fun of it all. Uh, thanks for the question. Now, oh, I was gonna say, some people try and make their own gratings uh, and the grating foil that we typically find in the little handheld glasses is typically 100 or 1,000 lines per millimeter. And they have so much dispersion that the spectrum is spread out so much, it's too dim to see and doesn't fit on our sensors. Um, but anyway, thanks for that question too. I think the one, the one that I used to, one of the ones I used to use a long time ago was a 1200 lines per yeah. inch. In but I think we were probably further away than the camera was. Yeah, or even closer. Uh, and the 1200 on a slit spectrometer, that's something that often gets done. But what happens is, and in fact, for just a moment, I, I've got something I'll, I'll show the group here that, that is, is really fantastic. When, when you have higher and higher resolution, what you've done is stretch out the spectrum further and further. I just, you know, I'm having trouble finding my video preview. I just wanna make sure my video camera, oh, there we are, I'm on page two. Just wanna make sure my visual antics are visible. So if we stretch the spectrum out more and more, eventually we get to the point where we're just able to look at a tiny piece of it. And what I wanna show you with a quick screen share is it's a solar spectrometer. It comes from Sheliac in France, and it's a perfect tool to augment your daytime solar outreach. Because again, like at nighttime, you can bring a little bit more science uh, to your uh, star parties and outreach. So in this case, uh, the vertical lines are just noise from the grating and slit, but these horizontal lines are the spectrum. And I'm just going to play this video while I talk for a moment, and you'll get to see as, as I uh, push a lever on this device, we're scrolling through the colors because this is a high-resolution spectrum. You can see all the different lines. Now, the colors in real life are stunning. So that's the hydrogen alpha line that we're able to observe in high resolution. One other quick example just to show you, um, we'll get down here, is there are certain lines that are actually doublets or triplets, as we saw earlier. And down here is uh, the sodium doublet that we're able to see with this device. It's really exciting. And it, the reason I thought of it is because it's a high resolution device that uh, only lets you look at a thin piece of the spectrum. 
only bad news about this Shellyac device is its price. Uh, its price, and I apologize for not having it in a common currency, uh, its price in the US is about $1,400. So it's probably about 1,100 uh, Great British pounds. It's not cheap. But it's, I mean, it's fantastic if you can get one. Uh, because then when you have people queued up to look through a solar scope, you can have a second cube going on where you're actually talking a little more science. Thanks, John, for the question. Thanks, Tom. Great talk. Tom, perhaps I could ask, um, perhaps I could ask one, uh, Tom. I, I seem to remember uh, looking at the website. Um, you, you mentioned analyzing the atmosphere of Neptune. Yes. Um, do you just want to just talk for 30 seconds on that? Yeah, it's, um, it's something which is uh, doable because Neptune is uh, with a, a star analyzer grading. Even though Neptune is, is you know, physically large, it's almost a point source. You couldn't look at the atmosphere of Saturn or Jupiter or Venus because they're too big. And I'm looking over here looking for that screen capture of it. Uh, and it's, it's going to be uh, just where you can see a little bit of the methane bands of, of, that, um, of that object. Let me bring it up here and I'll show it to you. Yeah, let's see if I can bring that up. Uh, that's certainly not it, is it? So I'll give it another second. Uh, I don't, I don't seem to be able to bring it up right now. So let me stop my screen sharing, but you're going to be able to see the methane bands on those planets. It's not the kind of thing that you can do a detailed study of. And one thing I should mention, uh, and that is, and I alluded to this earlier, when you, normally when we all image, the star's photons fall on a handful of pixels, right? Depending on our full width half maximum. Now you take that same starlight and you put it through a grating You've now taken the same total number of pixels and spread them out across, uh, photons, excuse me, and spread them out across hundreds of pixels. You lose five or six magnitudes when you do that. That, I, I see some uh, video feeds here where people are sort of slumping and frowning and, and understandably. But the, the exciting thing is most of the stars that we look at that are really bright, visually or, or even with a camera are boring, right? Maybe there's a little color. The good news in spectroscopy is there's a ton of stars that are mag four, five, and six, seven, that are really interesting spectroscopically. So even though we're losing that light by spreading it out so much, uh, decreasing our, uh, our sensitivity of our equipment, there's still plenty to be seen. What else? Thanks, Tom. I, I've got a couple of observations, but I think given, given the time, um, Will, are there any questions come on YouTube? Um, yes, we've, we've got a few questions here. Um, overall, just some response from YouTube, Tom. It's, uh, everybody's really enjoyed your presentation. Fantastic. And as Mark said, enthusiasm is up there, right up there. Excellent. <laughs> so um, kind of a, um, a, big, a big question to start is from um, Burak Belize. Is there a possibility that new elements can be discovered using spectroscopy in space? That's above my pay grade, I'm afraid to say. And believe me, my pay grade is pretty low. But uh, uh, I think the new elements will be probably discovered somewhere else unless they're forbidden lines of some sort. But I'm not really qualified to answer that. Uh, I'm more of a, of a knuckle dragger uh, in the software world. And I'll tell you, the reason I like software instead of hardware is because I break things. In software, edit undo and I'm back to where I was before I messed up. It's a, I wish sometimes there was an edit undo in life. You know, Wouldn't that be great? So Absolutely. as far as far as new elements, uh, I can't I can't answer. I suppose it's possible, but uh, that would be a, a somebody more advanced than me could determine that. Absolutely. And then um, we've got from Georgius uh, Lakers um, in the spectrum. I think this was near the start. There was a spectrum which he showed um, using an eight-inch telescope. There wasn't any O and G um, spectral type stars in it. Was there any reason for that? They, they say no. that. Is, is, there, is there problems with obtaining these um, spectrums or is it the rarity, for example? Jeez, no, there's no problem. I, I really uh, respect hats off to you for noticing that. It just happened to be the data that I had in hand. Those spectra get less and less interesting in the hydrogen bomber series because because they're hotter and harder star, stars, some of them. Uh, so that's, that's why there was really no significance. However, that gives me a, an interesting segue to show you one other thing. And this I will be able to easily share on my screen. I hope I have a moment more to share it. And that is, uh, Andrew, you can see that Alberio label there? Yeah. 
Okay, great. So this is a video uh, uh, shot in mono, which is more sensitive. And I'm gonna just start a playing here. We have Alberio A and B in the field of view. This is about a 30, what, a 20 second video. So here we can see the spectrum jumping around live under the stars because of our seeing. Alberio B is, let me just stop the video for a second. Alberio B is a, a fairly hot star, right? And so it's got, what do I say? Do I say it down here? I don't say what type of star it is. However, I do have my little crib sheet here, which I have just for these talks. Alberio B is a hot star. It actually is a, a B star. Um, notice there's more energy over here in the blue end, the hot end of the spectrum. So now let's start the video up again. And we've just dragged the sampling box around the brighter of the two stars. This star is a cool type M star. And so now we're seeing more of the light, if we didn't let the video finish, now we're seeing more of the light over in the cooler red end. So the shape of this curve, which is not quite, but is like a Planck curve, helps us see something about the temperature involved. It's not the way professionals determine star types or temperatures, because it can be confounded by um, interstellar matter that would redden an image and, and other things. Uh, professionals use the existence of features. But this is really why I started spectroscopy. I wanted to literally, with Alberio, be able to do this, drag between the two stars and see the different shape of the two curves. And that's something that you can do. So thanks for giving me an opportunity to show that. What else? Excellent. And um, just trying to drag one out here. Um, let me see. We've just got um, from Vicky Froelich. Can you get the sun spectrum the same way, just with a sun filter, or is it? You know, could you maybe give an advice of just getting the spectrum of the sun? That's a that's a great question. Unfortunately, the sun is a, a you know far from a compact star-like object, right? It's enormous in the sky. So although it's possible to get a solar spectrum, uh, it's it's not all that uh, easy or interesting. I'm going to share my screen here just to show you on the samples page of my site. Uh, and there is, if I look for solar, there it is. So here's an interesting way to do a solar spectrum. You use a sewing machine needle, and this is just a piece of cardboard folded up, and there's the spectrum. Unfortunately, the spectrum isn't particularly interesting. We can see some Fraunhofer lines, uh, but typically the way people study solar spectrum isn't with a grating like this, it's with a slit device. Unfortunately, the filters that we have uh, will interfere with the spectrum, so we can't use those. Uh, the other thing, if you're interested in doing a uh, solar spectrum, there's a better view of how that fold-up device works. This guy, David Hayworth, whose uh, quasar spectrum we used, captured some really uh, exciting spectra, uh, and I wanted to show you an example of that, and that's not it. Um, I guess this is it right here. Oh, so here's what he did. He used a DVD instead of a grating. A uh, DVD has a lot of lines per millimeter. This is a, this is a fun pro do it yourself project. He used this as a reflecting slid. He mounted it all in this, uh, you know, construction tube uh, uh, form and, uh, and he captured spectra. He, oh, he put a camera up here at the end. It's, I mean, there's a lot of juggling to make it work, but if this is the kind of thing you're interested in, this is a cool project. And as I mentioned here on the samples page of our site are uh, lots of examples of the kinds of things, including this one. Uh, there's that missing O star up here that uh, earlier question uh, was asked about, but there's lots of examples uh, on the site that you can visit. And uh, the other thing I might mention is somebody mentioned my enthusiasm and it's authentic. I, I love showing things that I don't sell like that screwdriver spectrograph because I'm clearly not in it for the money if I'm showing you a do it yourself project, right? Even though I'm an American and I'm a businessman, I must be a capitalist pig, right? But uh, what I wanted to show you was that on the site, we have a contact form. Uh, there's live chat down here. I love getting people started. Uh, and so don't hesitate to ask me questions if you got them, uh, because uh, it's a real pleasure to help in any way that I can. That's uh, fantastic, uh, Tom. You've uh, answered and you've expanded on those questions marvelously for all of us amateurs. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, for answering all those questions. Um, I'm sure we could carry on for, for hours, actually, but um, can we all um, thank Tom again? Thank you.
thank you very much. I'm going to leave now. And uh, I would say that I'm, you can talk about me behind my back, but I'm headed over to YouTube right now to see what's going on over there. <laughs> okay. Thank Thanks you, again, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Good evening. Yeah.